Today we are talking with Dr. Ian Teresal, the author of The Strange Case of the Rickety Cossack and Other Cautionary Tales from Human Evolution. Welcome to the Dara. Thank you. You have a fascinating book after the book you had on Master of the Planet, and we are very excited to know a little bit more about it. What is the book all about? Well, you mentioned uh, the book called uh, Masters of the Planet, which was my attempt to sort of understand how human beings manage to become the kind of very unusual creatures that they are. But in writing that book, I found that I had to sort of omit all of the history of the study of uh, human evolution. And I realized I had to go back to it uh, to have a complete explanation. And this new book, The Strange Case of the Rickety Cossack, is really my uh, account of how we have come to know what we think we know about uh, human evolution and how my own evolution fit into that. And as you go on to explain in the book, there it has been many uh, random cases rather than some kind of grand plan in how we have arrived where we have so far. That's right. The way we think uh, we evolved has been very much influenced by the order of the discovery of the fossils that uh, constitute the uh, human fossil record and therefore the order in which they were studied and uh, basically how the evidence for human evolution accumulated. And that has had a major effect on our um, uh, perceptions today. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the technology has played a big role, and what we know today is really based on what we knew yesterday or just in the near past. Exactly. We really can't understand uh, what we think we know today unless we understand how we got there, uh, how this edifice of knowledge that we have right now uh, was uh, built up. And, of course, technology uh, played uh, a significant role in the building up of that edifice. Mm -hmm. You have a long history and very distinguished history of being in this field. Give us a little bit of historical view, starting from Charles Darwin, that how the study of our biological evolution or biological past has happened, and, and, and what were the major milestones that we know, but where was the, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, as you say, a cautionary tale that we should focus on? Right. The uh, initial... Um evidence of uh, that, that humans are not alone in the world or certainly were not alone in the world and they, that they have uh, an evolutionary past came in the form of the Neanderthals. Uh, the Neanderthals are, are an extinct form of humankind that uh, lived in Europe and Western Asia in the period uh, following about 200,000 years ago. And they're very recent. And they're related to us, but they're not ancestral to us. Uh, but the fact was that these very uh, recent relatives were found uh, found first and then became iconic of the, the human past. It was only later that uh, older relatives were added to the, uh, uh, to the list of uh, fossil relatives that we have. And basically in inverse order, you found uh, in the 1890s, which was about 40 years after uh, Darwin wrote, the form uh, Homo erectus was discovered in uh, Eastern Asia, in Java specifically, and it became iconic of the earlier phase of human evolution. And then only in the 1920s were truly ancient uh, relatives of humans found um, in Africa. So in a sense, the, uh, the human fossil record was found in reverse order. <laughs> the book title... The title has the word strange. Well, what is the strange case of Rickety Cossack? Uh, it's um, it's a, a slightly um, ironic title based on the fact that when the very first Neanderthal specimen was found in Germany back in 1856, the notion of evolution had not yet been articulated. Uh, Darwin published his uh, book on the origin of species in 1859, and only after that publication uh, did we have an evolutionary framework in which to place any fossil humans that were found. 
So there was no uh, evolutionary framework when uh, the original Neanderthal was found, and people tried to explain it in terms of the world that they knew. And one very uh, far-fetched explanation for the strange anatomy of this uh, fossil that had been found that was clearly close to Homo sapiens, but not at all the same thing, uh, one of the explanations was that maybe this was a pathological specimen, that the uh, skeleton had belonged to a Cossack horseman who'd suffered from rickets and had knit his brows in agony, uh, forming big bony ridges above his eyes. He had apparently bow legs, which were the legs of a horseman, it was felt. And putting that together with historical information, somebody suggested that the remains were those of a Cossack horseman with rickets who'd ridden across uh, Germany in uh, 1814 on his way to raid France in the wake of the Napoleonic debacle. <laughs> the record keeping has become a great science and has uh, considerably become very uh, sophisticated and yet uh, sometimes we fall into the patterns and we kind of, I think as you explained that we kind of follow the statements or beliefs that come out from the people who are supposed to be well known and people whom we trust and some of the things have been systematically standardized and that's where we fall into some of the uh, major behavior patterns that could be avoided. Well indeed we're very much affected by the worldview that we're introduced to uh, very early on in our lives. So most people tend to cleave to the uh, the, the viewpoint that they were taught in their first introduction uh, to human evolution in college, which in my case is 50 years ago now. And of course, what we believed then was, um, the, uh, was uh, very different from uh, what the evidence is telling us now. And one of the difficulties is getting away from what one was originally taught and objectively assessing uh, the evidence that we have today rather than trying to interpret it in the light of the sort of paradigms that one was initially taught. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as you go on in explaining several times in the book, that let the evidence speak for itself rather than try to fit it within your existing framework or the beliefs that you have. That's correct, yes. In fact, we have a lot of evidence now, you know, that uh, paleoanthropologists are always complaining that the, you know, they need more fossils. And of course they do, and of course they need to complain because if they don't complain, nobody is going to give them any uh, money to go out and uh, find any more. But in fact, what we have now is a really pretty good and substantial uh, human uh, fossil record that really needs to be reappraised in the light of what it actually is rather than uh, try to be fit into uh, uh, earlier uh, views and try to be back compatible, as it were, with earlier views. Uh, would you care to explain or give us uh, two or three examples so people, the listeners can relate with that? You know, I mean, in the last 40, 50 years, there have been significant developments, and I'm sure there have been also significant adjustments people have to make in their uh, acceptance of what, what the evidence leads us to. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. In 1950, uh, the uh, study of human paleontology was kind of uh, chaotic because it had been carried out mainly by human anatomists who were not very familiar with the diversity of organisms in the living world and intended to, to try to interpret uh, human fossils within this, uh, this framework of what they knew, which was Homo sapiens. And as a result, a lot of extraneous names had accumulated in the uh, in the literature. And in 1950, an ornithologist called uh, Ernst Meyer came along and told the uh, paleoanthropologists in no uncertain terms that uh, they were completely wrong and that, that, in fact, human evolution was not this bewildering diversity of names that had haphazardly uh, accumulated but in fact consisted of a linear sequence of only three species that were known in the fossil record. What he called Homo transvalensis, uh, which is uh, what the, um, uh, we would call the Australopiths now, uh, Homo erectus, the one in the middle, and, and Homo sapiens uh, at the top of the tree. And there had been a sort of a gradual progression over time from uh, Homo transvalensis 
through uh, Homo erectus into Homo sapiens. And that was the wonderful and very persuasive linear story. It's kind of like a folk tale with the, the, um, the hero struggling against all odds to uh, triumph at the end of the book, as it were. And uh, this, this was a great story, and because the paleoanthropologists at the time really did not have a good theoretical framework to, uh, to stand on, they capitulated. And then for the next 50 years, people have been influenced by this linear story, by this progressive story, by the notion that one species evolved into another, into another, and then finally into Homo sapiens. And uh, what we've learned with many, many, many uh, new fossils being discovered, is this wasn't the case at all. Human evolution, in fact, has uh, consisted of a very vigorous experimental kind of process with new species being generated and sent out to compete on the ecological stage and, and succeeding or failing and going extinct. And that what we have, instead of a tall, slender tree of human evolution, is basically a very uh, bushy, um, kind of a, a structure. We have a bush instead of a of of a tree here, and um, uh, yet there is this mindset that we've inherited from what Ernst Meyer told us, and we try to we try to re uh, retain the sort of slender tree-like structure as much as we can. For example, by expanding the species Homo uh, erectus. Uh, beyond any uh, really reasonable um, anatomical limits in order to try to maintain the linear structure in the story or as much as possible. And yet the information that we have now really militates against this and it suggests we have to change our uh, way of looking at the record. Any other discovery that, that, that have shattered our formal or well-established belief with the molecular biological uh, technologies that we use nowadays? Yeah, no, the the uh, molecular systematists have uh, have uh, really uh, shaken up uh, paleoanthropology. Uh, at this point, it has uh, the, these techniques really only extend back in time to the Neanderthals. We have a Neanderthal genome now um, that we can um, that we can analyze, and um, uh, but we don't have anything really going back much beyond that. So we have our genome, and we have the genome of the uh, of the, of our closest living relatives, the apes, and of uh, the great apes, and uh, then we have the the uh, Neanderthal genome. So as techniques get refined, and maybe we can get DNA out of earlier and earlier fossils, we'll know more. But at the present time, it seems that. Uh, the the, the ge genetic signal, the genomic signal, is that Neanderthals are indeed very distinctive uh, from us. And yet, at some early stage in in um, uh, in the history of, of of Homo sapiens, we may have exchanged a few genes here and there uh, with uh, Neanderthals, but nothing uh, that would be really biologically meaningful in the sense that it changed the nature of our species. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things I think that you mentioned is that some of the claims, the groups of five uh, distinct individuals uh, discovered in 1991 in the east of Black Sea uh, belong to one species. And I think uh, you want to care explain a little bit about that ex uh, experience or, or experiment and where, where, where that evidence rather is leading us now? Yeah, that's right. Well, actually, 1992 was the first uh, uh, publication of this. It's a form from a uh, from a, a site in the Republic of Georgia on the eastern shores of the Black Sea called Dominici. It's a spectacular um, archaeological site that's been discovered, or rather paleoanthropological site that's been discovered underneath the ruins of a, a medieval town. And it has the fossils of the earliest immigrants from the continent of Africa. It seems that our family, the hominidae, evolved initially in Africa maybe uh, seven or eight million years ago, and that basically it was confined to Africa until about uh, 1.8 million uh, years ago, which is the date of these fossils from uh, uh, this place called the Manisi in Georgia. And they're very interesting in retaining very, very small brains 
and uh, uh, big uh, facial structure, uh, rather in the, the, the manner of modern apes. But they are fully bipedal, as indeed the uh, Australopiths had been in Africa for uh, many years, and they were tool makers of uh, rather crude um, stone tools. And these were the first hominids who managed to uh, get out of Africa and then expand into adjacent uh, areas of uh, Western Asia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the things I think you talk about towards the end of the book, and which uh, which is quite fascinating, uh, which uh, I think is one of the last chapters you have there that you uh, kind of share on this, that why does the knowing of uh, how we evolved, why does it matter? I think it matters to us uh, for, for uh, two main reasons. And one of them is that one of the sort of diagnostic uh, characteristics of Homo sapiens, of the species that we belong to, is its intense curiosity. And uh, we really need to know. We have this need to know. The study of paleoanthropology really responds to this deep inbuilt need that we have as Homo sapiens, a curious creature. And there's also, of course, the, the, the need to understand, you know, how our uh, uh, body as we know it today was, was built up so that we can take care of it uh, appropriately and understand it as a biomechanical uh, structure as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously knowing our past helps us uh, uh, how we can deal with our potential present, uh, present and potential future as well. That's, tr that's absolutely correct because we need to know the kind of, of creature that we are. And one of the received pieces of wisdom that we have is that uh, since we have an evolutionary history, we have somehow been fine-tuned uh, to be the kind of creature that we are. That in some way, nature has sort of dictates the, the way in, in which we behave. And yet, if we study the, uh, the, the evolutionary history and the archaeological record for, uh, for, for modern humans really closely, we realize that who we are is, is somewhat adventitious. We have not been fine-tuned by nature to be, uh, to, to, to be exactly what we are. We haven't been condemned by nature to behave in certain ways. That in fact, we are in, in some sense emergent and that uh, we are in fact, we have free will and that we are responsible for our own actions and that we can affect what our future will be. I'm going back into the book where you talk about your exper uh, experience in Comoros Island uh, and the Lemoors. Uh, it must have been in 1974. It must have been very fascinating for you to go there, and and and, and of course, anyone who is involved in, in, interested in this uh, topic or discipline, uh, Lemoors is very important. And uh, can you explain to a wider audience that may not understand the significance of it? Well, that's, yeah. Thank you for asking me that. Um, I'm um, a little unusual in having come in into paleoanthropology from the uh, from the study of lemurs, which are a group of primates in Madagascar that are fantastically diverse. There are many, many different uh, species of lemurs in Madagascar, all doing slightly uh, different things, and um, they made me acutely aware of the complexity uh, in that we see in nature and that everything is really part of an interacting uh, um, whole that is much greater than any one uh, species. So I think I was very fortunate in having studied lemurs and realized that diversity is the rule in nature because I'm looking at the human fossil record and I'm recognizing diversity there. And I'm trying to understand what the diversity and the, 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 the uh, the number of uh, different species that we see in the human fossil record means and what the pattern of that diversity was, rather than trying to, uh, to, to force it into this sort of linear um, paradigm that we've inherited in paleoanthropology. With your experience and in the hindsight, uh, why do you think diversity rules in nature? Is there any one or multiple reasons why that is the kind of role that nature has, why nature hasn't simplified or nature is always on the experimental stage, as you said, it throws it up on ecological 
um, or rather uh, stage there and then we see which one succeeds and doesn't succeed. Is that really the evolution? Is That's how dictated is constant experimentation and then survival of the fittest? Yeah, that's how, that's how uh, uh, nature works. That's why there are something, you know, in, in excess of uh, uh, 20 million species of organisms in the world today. Nobody knows how many uh, species there actually are out there. They are right now are un uncounted. But the world is just jam-packed with different species, all exploiting different effects and different uh, possibilities within the the environment that the uh, that the planet affords and nature has always tried to fill those uh, those that huge variety of niches that are out there and um every time there has been a mass extinction and there have been five major mass extinctions that uh, paleontologists have uh, identified over the last uh, uh you know billion years or so Nature has always rebounded and refilled all of those niches and explored all of the possibilities. And this is just what nature does. Uh, the, the nature has this inbuilt tendency to diversify. And uh, humans, the hominid family, are really no exception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where the argument you have, that we are no exception, uh, unlike what we were led to believe just 50 years ago. That's correct, yeah. You know, the, the, the paradigm is, is that we have been gradually burnished generation by generation by natural selection to, to be the kind of uh, creatures that we are today. And in fact, uh, we, we find a very, very different pattern when we look at the fossil record. We find a lot of different species out there, uh, each one of them uh, sort of uh, experimenting with the potential that's inherent in being a member of the the human family and you know as i said this is just uh, typical of what nature does it would be very unusual in fact if we were to discover that our evolutionary history was just a question of the the fine tuning of one lineage from generation to generation until a, a perfect product uh, emerged We've been talking with Dr. Ian Tedesall, uh, the author of The Strange Case of the Rickety Concert. That was all about the book and the topic. Tell us a little bit more about you. How did you get involved in this thing and how did you get interested in this uh, discipline from the early on? What brought you in? How did you get ex excited about it? Well, really, it was happy accident. I, uh, I was uh, raised in, 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 in East Africa, and I had a sort of an interest uh, in uh, anthropology at the time. But I thought that basically anthropology was, uh, was ethnology, the study of the diversity of human cultures that we have around the, uh, uh, the globe. And I wanted to study it uh, at, uh, when I went to, to college. And when I did that, and I and I went to uh, to to college to study anthropology, I discovered that um, anthropology also has a biological aspect to it. And immediately, I recognized that it was this biological aspect of uh, anthropology that really uh, appealed to me, and I, I really wanted to to follow up on a career basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, uh, how did you end up here in the United States? From my East Africa. Well, I was I went to uh, to my my family left uh, Uganda a little bit before independence came along, and uh, they returned to to England. And I went to college there, and there were many connections between the academic establishments uh, in England and the United States. And through that kind of connection. I, uh, I, I I had the opportunity to come to the United States to do uh, graduate work, and um, after my uh, graduate graduation from uh, from graduate school, I I uh, had the opportunity to come and work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where I've been very happy ever since. Wonderful, wonderful. It is indeed wonderful. I've been very very happy at the way my career has worked out. Do you see any other book or uh, uh, synthesis uh, down the line now that you got this, if I understand, the second book? Or, or do you see any other projects that where you can compile all the knowledge and wisdom that you have collected over the years? 
Yeah, there are certain future directions. Um, I think with the the masses of the planet and the rickety Cossack, I've said really what I wanted to say about how we became the creatures that we are and uh, how uh, we know about that. And uh, now I think I'd, I, there are two things I want to do is, and one of them is to, to return to the implications of our evolutionary history for the kind of creature that we are. And it's very early days yet to, uh, to talk about this. But the fact that we are kind of an adventitious creature with incredible um, cultural capacity, but incredible um, flexibility within that capacity, tell us a lot about the human condition, or rather the non-condition that humans have. And I'd like to explore that uh, in more depth. And the other thing is I'd like to go back to uh, to, to lemurs, too, because uh, lemurs are uh, an incredibly, as we discussed, an incredibly diverse um, uh, group of, uh, of, uh, of, of primates. And uh, that diversity, I don't think, has been fully uh, characterized as yet. And so I'm planning to work on that too. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for your time and your com- comments and a uh, fascinating book uh, and hope that we would uh, you would keep us in mind when you have the next book ready. Well, I should uh, love to do that. And uh, thank you so much for your uh, very keen questioning and uh, for uh, uh, taking the time with me. You're welcome. Thank you very much.